throughout a great portion of my life, I was crippled by a very severe depression, as many people are these days, I think. It stemmed from physical dysphoria, wrong, wrong beliefs, self-loathing, and there even is a genetic history of melancholia in my family, so genetically predisposed for it. But depression has been a constant demon and teacher in my life. Because when you're depressed, you do at least gain the advantage of viewing things from a strange perspective. Disillusionment. I have, over the past year or two, finally, I believe, I can safely say, crawled out of a long depressive phase that began with a severe disillusion, disillusionment that occurred during a particularly troubling part of my life when I started college and lived abroad and was basically completely isolated from everyone for several years. But that's a story for different time, maybe. But how have I learned to cope and overcome my depression? Several components. One component was a shift in how I think about things. I used to be a Christian because I was raised in a Christian family. I tried to be a Christian. From early childhood, I had severe doubts, which I stifled because actually the livelihood of my parents was tied up with Christianity. And from there, I moved to theism, trying different, a spiritual exploration phase where I looked into Gnosticism and then occultism and then uh, Buddhism, finally Taoism, and then materialist atheism, which is where I am currently, which is what I enjoy currently, because escaping the clutches of belief in the supernatural is was a really good feeling for me. No longer did I have to worry about doing things that attract the ire of powerful, scorned, scornful entities and uh, did no longer have to heed the words of raving lunatics and shyster gurus who I see mirrored in the many grifters of today. I think a lot of old religion was merely dressed up grifterism. And now we live in the age of mass-produced uh, <laughs> pop grifterism. But in any case, materialism, atheism, embracing these things, understanding these things, escaping irrational belief, helped. Exercise helped. For many years, I neglected my body because I was stuck in dualism. I saw the mind and body as being distinct. The mind being the soul being trapped in the body like a prison. And I thought that the mind slash spirit was valuable while the body was dirt. And so I neglected my body. I did not exercise. I did not eat right. 
and I felt poorly because of it, and my brain did not produce enough dopamine because of it. But going to the gym and working really hard taught me to uh, grin at suffering, to adopt the the mode of the rictus, rictus grin, the grin, laughing at suffering, realizing it's inevitable in life, getting it over with, paying for high dopamine levels, paying for consistent better physical feeling and mental clarity with six hours of toil and suffering each week. There is some sort of karma in this world. It's not it's not a supernatural supernatural always occurring thing, but in general you can rely on some patterns of paying for well being with suffering. In some places that does work. In some components, some corners of, of living, karma is a thing that's real. There's a karma of exercise. That's what I'm trying to say. I think that was, I don't know. Anyway, another component or another factor that helped me escape depression or quell it, come to terms with it and, and, and uh, synthesize it positively into my own being, my intrinsic melancholia, I mean, was um, reading <laughs> pessimistic philosophers, ver pessimistic philosophers, I still read the Tao Te Ching, even though I, it's not entirely up my alley anymore, and I read Zhuangzi, another Taoist philosopher, I read Siran a lot, I'm big into Siran, and his moaning about the pains of life and the futility of pretty much everything. And it's actually comforting to me. Because when everything is in the end futile, when you realize that in the end humanity will all go away and every single thing will be forgotten, it's really comforting because it means that your mistakes don't really matter in the long, long, long run. But it's strange. My solace is in embracing disquiet. I don't know. It's strange. It's very strange. These are thoughts that I've never articulated, so please bear with me if it's somewhat disjointed, if it doesn't connect up quite right. But So what were my components? Well, I'll review. How did I overcome depression? Adopting an atheistic worldview a very skeptical atheistic worldview. Exercise. The reading of pessimistic philosophers. I guess it's like commiserating, really. I'm sorry, I have to go on a tangent right now. I know why it's comforting. When you read these philosophers that are melancholic, that are pessimistic, like Schopenhauer, or Siren, or uh, Zapfa, you know, these philosophers, or even fiction, like Poe and Lovecraft, when you read people who are skeptical about existence, its value, and all things, you are commiserating. And such people with such views are difficult to find in day-to-day -day life, unless you live in a big city where you can meet up with such people easily and find them like on internet meetup groups and such. So I think a big portion of my depression came not from 
oh, you're just predisposed to be sad. No, I don't think I'm predisposed to be sad. I think I have always had an outlook that was somewhat in contention with the norm. I've always been sort of at a, at a wavelength that is at an odd angle, an odd wavelength. And commiseration, whether it be over the internet or via reading or watching videos of people who are talking about their own troubles, that is commiseration. There's a Schopenhauer quote, which I'm going to utterly uh, mess up, but it goes along the lines of how we need to look at each other with the attitude of prisoners in a prison. We are all here in this existence, in this the same prison. We're in the same shit. And we can make it a little better for all of us if we commiserate in the manner of fellow inmates. I think that this view is very valuable. I think it's the beginnings of the overcoming various prejudices and biases. It's overcoming differences between humans. If we can all see that none of us ask for this shit, we're all stuck here, let's try to make the best of it. So commis commiseration, I'm focused on this now. I think that is the major component. That is what I've learned how to do quite well, what I do regularly, which helps keep the depression at bay. My worldview, non-dualistic now, viewing the human being as a continuous mind-body organism with gradations separating the neocortex from the big toe, gradations that can be identified through deep meditation and just inner searching. That helped. And I think I said exercise already. Sorry for the rambling nature of this video. I'm working out these thoughts as I speak them. I think I've always been trying to be a very human human. Very human human. Something that makes us different from other animals is that we have this human ability to really go against our instincts. We can choose to give up, well, higher animals, I shouldn't say higher, but there are animals that share food to help another being that's in stress, but this is, I think, definitely more common among humans. This is a human thing. This is a good thing. Selflessness. What am I trying to say here? What does it say about nature when to be good you must be aberrated against nature? I truly believe that the antinatalist view is the correct view and the most righteous view according to harm reduction, that, that goal or whatever. And that so flies against the intentions of our DNA, of our mechanism, that so flies against ingrained instinct. What is this quality? Can we call this quality human? 
to totally go against the double helix. Other creatures do this. They do this. I don't know where I'm going with this. But what does this mean? I think there are humans out there who are no better than ants. And I, I think that going, accommodating the double helix, always obeying it leads to really horrible things like ethnic cleansing, hate, rape. What is this? Breed, breed, increase the tribe at, at whatever cost, murder. All of these evil things are rooted in the self-preservation instinct of our DNA. An outgrowth of natural processes in the context of our earthly environment. So does this mean that nature itself is evil? And aren't we of nature? But how can we be of something that is evil and be good? Does that mean nature is both evil and good? I don't know. To me, it seems there is something noble about defying DNA. Defying it. What is DNA? It's on this mad quest for propagation. But it's a futile quest because now we can prognosticate our own apocalypse. So the pyramids will crumble and every single trace of human existence will be wiped from the face of the earth. And DNA will fail. So do I really want to side with a loser like DNA. No, I'll go my own way from DNA. <laughs> what a fucking weird ramble this was. Very weird. Well, maybe you got something out of it. <laughs>